Amongst the last of the LG phones, we have the LG Velvet. This phone was the successor of the LG G8, but in a Pixel 5 way. But now it's 2023, and we have to figure out what it's like using the LG Velvet this year, and if it's still worth buying. Hello everyone, this is Matt from Real World Review, and today we have a pretty solid budget, but not, 5G phone. Let's get started. Now the biggest thing that makes this phone stand out is the design. Starting with the front, we get a curved 6.8 inch 1080p OLED display, which is pretty big. It is a 60Hz display with 395 pixels per inch, so don't expect the best, but images still look pretty nice on here. On the top, we get that little U-shape for the front camera, which is the 16 megapixel fixed focus sensor, which we'll talk about later. On the bottom, we get the fingerprint scanner, which works pretty well, never really leaving me with trouble getting into this phone. And that's a good thing because there's no face unlock, which is kind of strange, but normal for an LG device. Moving to the sides, we get a nice durable aluminum that wraps around the phone. The top is where the SIM tray and the microphone is, the former which allows for an SD card. The left side is where you get the volume buttons and the Google Assistant button, but know that the Assistant can be disabled if you want to do that. And I highly recommend it. The right side is where the power button is, and the fun part is on the bottom. Here we get the 3.5mm headset jack with no built-in quad DAC. If that doesn't sound important to you, then it isn't. If you know what it is and you feel sad, well then just go with the LG V60. To the right of that is where we get the USB-C 3.0 port that supports video out in either 16 or 25 watts of fast charging. I'll explain that later. To the right of that, we get the loudspeaker, which sounds pretty good, and pairs with the top earpiece to allow for dual sound, but not stereo at all, and it's kind of a weird addition. With that said, LG never really did make too many dual speaker phones. Moving to the back of the phone, we get a curved back with a water drop kind of look, or at least that's what I call it. Here we get the main camera, a depth sensor, and an ultra-wide sensor, with the final touch being that camera flash. The back has a nice curve, making the phone look sharp, but ended up being pretty nice to hold in the hand, but very slippery. Did you know that this is not only IP68 dust and water resistant, but military standard 810 certified? Yep, that means that this phone technically can be used for military purposes, but come on. This is a tall phone, like Pixel 7 Pro in a case, and still taller, tall. But it is kind of strange that it's fairly light at 180 grams. This is a premium phone with a metal frame, Gorilla Glass 5 on both glasses, and 5G with ultra wideband support depending on the model that you buy. And the inside is where we find the value, sort of. The phone is powered by a 4,300 milliamp cell normally. This one has a 4,000 milliamp cell. Yes, the Verizon and AT&T versions of this phone are not the same as the T-Mobile version, and when you buy the phone overseas, you get even more mixed up. This also means that the processor is not the Snapdragon 765G chip or even the 845 chip in the 4G version. Instead, this is the T-Mobile version with the MediaTek 1000C chip, which might actually be the best version of this model. There's a slight boost in performance and battery life, which makes sense why they would go with the 4000 milliamp cell instead of the bigger one. That's also why I said we get 16 watts of charging, because the Snapdragon version gets 25 watts of wired charging. Though all versions do get 9 watts of wireless charging capabilities. As for battery capacity, it's okay. It's a three-year-old phone, so battery life won't be the best to begin with, but all-day battery life should be easy to achieve. Now the cameras are the same across the board, but image processing is slightly different. With that said, images do vary, and for the most part, I am satisfied with what the MediaTek version produces. The main sensor is a 48 megapixel camera that is optically stabilized, while the ultra-wide is an 8 megapixel sensor that is fixed in focus and stabilization. The last sensor is a 5 megapixel depth sensor, which doesn't really help much unless it's used for focusing. The front, like I said, is a 16 megapixel sensor that produces shots that are passable but not really anything special. To me, the camera set is just like the video capabilities. Good, but not the point of the phone. Still, you get some crisp shots if you try, but I wouldn't really say that the camera is set like an Apple or Samsung device in this price point, like the Samsung S20 FE. You do get 4K at 30 frames per second max on the rear and front camera, but not on the ultra wide. But either way, the footage isn't really that good. Finishing off this section, I'll let you know that 128GB of UFS 2.1 storage is standard, but allows for an SD card. This phone comes with 6GB of RAM, but is not expandable. With that said, there is an 8GB version out there, I just don't know where. Overall, performance is good, but not perfect. 
The 60 hertz screen shows this phone's age, which would normally not be an issue, but the processor and Android 12 don't help that much. Android 13 on this phone is questionable with how many different variants that there are for this phone, not to mention very few phones in this class actually getting Android 13. Though with my luck, Android 13 will come out on one variant of this phone a day after I post this video and I'll get a bunch of comments complaining about it. There's no Android 13 on my phone and no signs of it coming in, so I don't know what to tell you. Now last year, this phone was an interesting choice under that $150 price point. But just like this one, other phones have dropped in price. Using Swappa as a benchmark, let's say that the LG Velvet is about a $100 phone. Not too bad and better than the A42 5G that I recently reviewed. Take an S20 FE for $50 or $75 more and you lose that glass back, but gain a better camera system, processor, and Samsung spin on the operating system, not to mention Android 13, which has been here since the start of 2023. And if you want to stay with LG, the LG V60 is... Well, it was cheaper, but has seen a boost in demand, it seems. Maybe because of the Android 13 update? Not really sure what happened there. I got mine for under $200, so I don't know what happened there. And of course, the Pixel 6 is under $200, so now you should get my idea. Other than its looks, the LG Velvet has pen support, and, well, that's it. But ultimately, if your budget is limited to $100, this is one of, if not still, the best choice. The LG Velvet marked the literal departure from flagships and essentially phones from LG, with the LG Velvet 2 never being officially launched, but it is out there. It is a strange jump, originally being called the LG G9, but lost its flagship feel like the Pixel 5 and ended up with Velvet. A strange phone that is actually good, but with its limitations. This phone is not for me, but at the price, I would say that this phone is for everyone that doesn't want to spend much on a phone. But how long will it last? I would say that this model has another year or two before people should stop buying these phones. And this concludes my review of the LG Velvet in 2023, the budget flagship phone with a smooth name and price. Feel free to talk in the comments, and as always, thanks for watching.